And my co-host joining us this evening is Teresa Simpatico. Welcome. I think she's frozen there. So we're going to try to get Teresa back online. Uh, that will probably come on online in a minute. Anyways, in the meantime, what I will tell you is welcome to another edition of Tanya Talks. We are actually going to be talking about self-care tips tonight and giving you all kinds of tips on self-care and what we can do. We've got eight pointers on the go with um, self-care and here she is joining us again. I think she's muted there. So welcome Teresa, our co-host. I think you're on mute. You're on mute, you're on mute, unmute yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness, technical difficulties. Yeah, yeah, that was really strange. I never lose connection, but I lost connection. So that was- We had a little pause. I think I think the universe is uh, testing me this evening to see how on point I was. So I just shared with the audience that tonight you're my co-host and we are talking about self-care tips and we've got, you know, you'll be leading the way, uh, my co-host with eight self-care tips of, um, of what we can do to take care of ourselves. Again, we are real talk, real people, real issue, real events. And I thought this evening it would be nice for me to just kind of be free without, because I, I got to tell you, it's an area I struggle in self-care tips, um, self, you know, self-care, anything for myself. I work at it. It's, it's not easy, but I will have to work at it. So where do we begin? Yeah, self-care is such a great topic because it's one of those things that we forget about so often that we're so busy taking care of other people, other things, work and life that we really don't take care of ourselves. I think this goes for all individuals, not just for women, but for men, for children. It's just, it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to talk about it to remind people that it's so important. So I wanna start with physical self-care because I know that that's one of the most important to me. And it's really good when you have that physical self-care, you're taking care of your body. So that transfers to your emotions, your, your mental well-being, your state of mind, does a lot of things for us. In the moment when you're stressed or anxious, breathing is a form of self-care, pausing mm -hmm. and breathing or in that moment going for a walk. It doesn't have to be an hour walk. We're not talking about, if exercise is part of it, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about just to get out in that moment so that you can free yourself from whatever it is that's bogging you down. It could just be a minute. It could be walking up the road. It could be walking it's around. It's just kind of like breaking apart everything, like disconnecting from everything that's going on. Exactly. I mean, physical self-care can be, going to hide in your bathroom and sitting for a few moments just to <laughs> by yourself. How many of us would have done that? <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> so I feel like the physical aspect is really important. Um, in within that, eating things that are really good for you. I'm not saying not to have dessert because that's also really good for your well-being, having a nice piece of chocolate or a cake. I'm saying overall to nourish our bodies with good food. Fast foods aren't good for us. We know that. I'm not saying don't ever do it. It's more of a balance, but balance more on the side of healthy eating. And I find that when I eat healthier, that I feel better. I feel better mentally. I'm more clear in my thoughts. I, you know, my body feels better. I'm not as sluggish. So that's really important. Sleep. Let's talk about sleep. There's nights and there are nights. I used to have a lot of insomnia, so I couldn't sleep at all. And I can tell you that I was so, it would frustrate me and anger me. And without that sleep, I just felt terrible. So now I try to get at least seven and a half hours of sleep every night. It doesn't always happen. Once in a blue moon, I'll binge watch something and I can't stop and it's 3 a.m. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to feel terrible tomorrow. I've already set myself up. But overall, healthy sleep is really important for the body and the mind. So that's another part of physical care. And it's true from the sleep perspective, because I'm going to speak for myself through, from the eating, but like all, from the physical perspective, I know for myself that when I personally am well rested and I have had maybe five hours sleep, but I've had deep five hours deep restorative sleep where I'm like fully sleeping and I wake up and I'm so charged and I think better and I think clearer. Um, you know, physically, we talk about the water, our bodies are made up of 
how much percentage of water. Mm -hmm. And when I'm consciously drinking the required water for my body, and you know, there's new data that shows now that it's not just a standard eight, eight ounce glasses of water we require in a day. It just actually depends on you, your physical body, your size, your height, all these different factors. And when I have the amount of water that's required for me, I can actually, it's interesting, you're drinking and you can feel the water going through your physical system, at least for me. I can feel, I can't say that I did before, but now I can actually connect to that. The breathing aspect, when you tie in the breathing aspect of it, and then I allow myself to breathe, it, your body feels so different. Now, I want the audience to know that, do I do this every day? No. <laughs> However, when I do discipline myself and I go for those stretches, it is so rewarding between the sleep, the breathing, the eating. Uh, I actually tend to fast when I go through those moments and I feel more anchored because I can actually feel my organs not working overtime. Yeah. And regenerating almost like a yeah. regeneration. We won't go into fasting. Fasting is an amazing thing if you can do it. Um, and even if it's only for eight hours or 10 hours, you know, overnight for a certain amount of time. So you stop eating at a certain time. I love fasting. Uh, I don't do it all the time, but when I do go through those moments that I feel like I want to do that and I, and I do it, um, it, it does make me feel better. Right. It honestly does. And that's fantastic for those that want to do it. I think in physical self-care. Besides the sleep and good nutrition, which are really, really impactful for most people and really important, you know, the other things that you care to add to that, wonderful. But yeah. it doesn't have to be so profound, right? As Absolutely. As Absolutely. Like simple uh, things. Simple things. I'm going to take a bath or a shower because mm -hmm. in this moment, I just want to relax my body. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, like I said, going for a walk. And the word like, humans with our phones, like if you need it, put in reminders. If you need to drink that water and like me, I don't like plain water. I have a really hard time with it and I have to force myself to do it. So subconsciously, I just don't do it. We do have a soda stream with some flavored, naturally flavored water, which is really great. So I've been drinking a lot more water, yep. but I still have to remind myself to do it because I'm just not a water drinker. Mm -hmm. So if you plan it, like we plan the rest of our lives, why not? It just mm -hmm. becomes a little bit easier. Right. So, and I like the way that you're talking about it being simplified because you are correct. Not everybody is going to be able to go through stretch. And I think it's rewarding ourselves every day for those little steps that you talk about, the simple steps. Sitting in the bathroom for a minute, just like, you know, sometimes you sit at the edge of the tub and just breathe, as you say, like just pause for a moment and let it all go just for that moment, like a physical self like an it's, it's an exhale for me I, i'm going to use the word exhale it's like that moment of a self-care tip of an exhaling yeah you know when you're you know really heated or like something's really bothering you you know the 10 second rule like breathe or whatever the case may be but those are really important i know it doesn't seem like a lot but your body just from breathing and have having deeper breathing has it has an amazing impact mm -hmm. on I, I stopped to breathe just <laughs> <laughs> right. And how many of us just don't do it just because right. we feel like it's not that significant or it won't help, but it truly does. It has amazing physical uh, positive results when you're doing these things, drinking the water, breathe, just simple breathing, sleeping and nourishing. I mean, those are the most important. You can go beyond that exercise. I have been trying to get into back into exercise just to strengthen my body. And I'm having a real hard time and it's one of those things, but I'm trying not to be hard on myself about it. So when I do wonderful, I'm proud of myself. And when I don't, I'm not like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't do it again. I'm not hard on myself because those You're are the celebrating extras. those moments that we talked about it last week. Yes. Those moments where we're taking the moment to celebrate our small milestones when we are taking a moment to breathe. Exactly. So it's really important that we do celebrate those things. Mm -hmm. So anything you can do in a physical self-care will show itself in other areas of your well-being. Mm -hmm. So it helps with your mind, your body, your soul, it helps with everything. 
And we're putting oxygen. I just want to add to that self, the physical aspect of self-care. When we're stopping to breathe and we're drinking our required water and, you know, we, you don't have to remember like the audience, you guys don't have to remember all this, but just know in the back end of it, when you breathe, you're sending oxygen to the brain. When you're drinking your water, you're filtering your kidneys, you're regulating it, you're cleaning out the blood within your system. Even if you don't remember all these little things that I'm saying, just know that when you're doing it, the, the benefits of doing it on the back end, your body is just thanking you. So just, and then when you add gratitude and you celebrate those milestones where you did have, even if you're not having eight, eight glasses of eight, 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 eight ounce glasses of water a day, even if you're just do it in baby steps, if you have one glass of water in that moment, just celebrate that milestone in that moment. Your body will thank you for the gratitude, the love, the appreciation, the breathing, the letting go. Do the, uh, Teresa, you're always about the baby steps, the simple steps. Celebrate those ones. Absolutely. I mean, it, Rome wasn't built in a day. Like it, it's right. just the reality of life, right? So anything that we can do in physical self-care is amazing. Absolutely. Right? Because it helps us, like I said, with so many other aspects of our life. Right. But there's physical, right? There's so many different types of self-care that, you know, some that don't even, we don't even think about regularly, but let's talk about like psychological self-care. Right. Right. We have this amazing mind. How often do we use our mind for our creativity? How often are we mindful, present? What can we do to spark our mind, to, you know, bring it to life? Because we are creatures of habit. We do things on autopilot. So what can we do? And there's a few things. I mean, there's things that I can think of, like learn a new skill. And that could be simple. It could be like downloading Duolingo and, you know, going through maybe learning some Spanish or um, read a book. There's so many great books. Find something that you enjoy. And if you don't enjoy reading, get an audio book. Listen to it. All those things that really feed and fuel our mind. Um, the one thing that really comes to mind when I think about this is that we're so often on our digital devices, we're so often attached to our computers, our phones. What about a detox? Mm. What about removing yourself? How good would that feel not to have, first of all, the pressure of you know being on social media, what's going on, being in the know? What about just letting it all go? And I'm not saying you have to do it for long periods of time, because in our world, of course, you know, keeping us together is really important when we have our digital devices. But I'm saying for two hours before you go to bed, one hour, okay, half an hour. <laughs> you know, I know it's hard, right? So what I'm saying is we often, the last thing that we put down at night, not for all of us and great for those that don't, and I'm also a culprit of this, but I don't do it as often anymore. But the last thing I would put down is my phone. And the first thing I would do is pick up my phone. So it would go down. And, yeah, right? And I know we're all- And I've had to make a conscious decision. I will tell you mentally, emotionally, my life has changed or, or my life changes in those moments because I go in little pockets. Right. When I actually have my phone physically downstairs in my house, completely out of my bedroom, out of my sleeping zone, I am better for it. I sleep yeah. better. I think better. I'm not taking that weight of the unconscious phone, the pressures of what I have to do next, my calendar, my this, my that. It's just not present. And it's like, I almost want to, as I'm speaking out loud here, I almost want to go on and buy one of those old time alarm clocks and put it on my pizza. Oh, and I know, right? I know it's just, they don't work as well. They need a battery or they got to wind up or like we make all these excuses, but yeah, that's true. I do use it to wake up. Um, yeah. But you know what? You can put it away from you in your room so that it's not right by your bedside. So if you're right. using it for an alarm, put it somewhere where it's out of arm's length, mm -hmm. you know, so that it's not there for you to pick up in the morning. You have to physically get out of bed to turn it off, right? But you have to maybe control that aspect of it. 
but you're right. An old fashioned alarm clock would do the trick. <laughs> if we can but, manage the ticking, remember the Raggedy Ann, I'm going to date myself, Raggedy Ann and Andy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you hear the ticking noise in the background. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> let, let's talk about the psychological tip really quickly, because, you know, I find it fascinating that from this perspective, it is about finding, you said it early on, it's about finding that thing that stimulates you. And yeah. it, how many of us understand, I think, what stimulates us that can grab our attention as a self-care tip that nourishes us and feeds us, because it's going to be different. Not everybody's going to read a book. Not everybody's going to, you know, and where, and, and the other, I think the really big component to it is where do we find time when, you know, we just had a segment on burnout and a lot of us have a high threshold for taking on and taking on. So where do we find the time now to, as you talk about the detox, to let something go to invite space in to even learn what that self-care, psychological self-care looks like. Yeah, I think, that, I think that when we find something that we do enjoy, I'm not talking just reading a book or audio books, but drawing, painting, crossword puzzles, the, the list is endless. Like if you think about all the things that can stimulate your mind, I think it's fascinating that, you know, we don't sit and think about those things. What is it something that I, is there something I would like to try? Is there something I want to learn? I love to paint. I've loved to paint since I was a kid. I remember having one night uh, where we had like a paint night before COVID, of course, but it was amazing. And we sort of just all painted something and it was on the fly and it was a lot of fun and relaxing. And did I create a work of art? In my eyes, it was a work of art, but it was so releasing. And I felt like it was so good for my mind. I didn't expect that. It's amazing. Some of the things that I did as a kid were photography and painting. And two of those things that I really loved. And I haven't taken on the photography again, but the painting, I just, it just blew my mind. Now, have I done it again? Yes. And I find it brings my creative side out. I find that it stimulates my mind and makes me think. And it's meditative too. Painting for me is very meditative. So it allows me to be in the moment. I'm not thinking about everything else. I'm thinking about what color paint am I picking up next? What this, which way am I going to paint this line? And I find that painting is really um, one of those things. It's a, it sounds therapeutic almost. It, it is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being mindful is also really good for the mind mindful is also really good for the mind because you're doing things and you're you're being present in those moments and when you're doing that you're not filling the mind with all the other stuff because if you're focused on what you're doing at that moment and it could be anything like I'm going to pick up this glass I'm going to drink it what does it taste like if I'm thinking of those things, it doesn't allow for anything else to come into my mind because that's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. So I think mindfulness is a really good one for the mind. Uh, we talk about muscles. Mindfulness and meditation for sure are the ones that build the muscle of the mind, in my opinion. And I know that it's really helped me in becoming more present. It also allows the emotional side to calm down for me. and you know, because I know that I can also get real riled up and really I'm full of energy and go, go, go. And being present actually brings me to a place that where I'm more peaceful and more calm. So I find that that's a mind thing. Um, and that brings me to the next one. And it's more like emotional self-care. So what do we do for our emotions to make us like, let's think about the positive ones. Let's talk about the frequencies again. Let's talk about the ones at the top. How do we get to joy and love and laughter? Those things that bring us those emotions that make us feel really good. So for me, that would be watching a comedy because I know that I'm going to laugh. Hopefully I'm going to laugh. Hopefully I pick a good one because there are a lot that aren't, but <laughs> I mean, right. watching a comedy, um, is really a good one for me because that does bring me laughter. And again, you're focused on what you're watching and very hard to focus on anything else. 
Yeah, so, tied into the physical because as you're laughing, your body responds to it and it's just kind of, it, it interacts, it all interacts together, participates together psychologically, emotionally, now physically. Yeah, there's more, there's more to this one. Um, I want to talk about boundaries and emotional mm -hmm. boundaries being uh, around. It. It's massive. Like we don't, we are for me anyways, I want to, I'm really speaking, when I talk, I'm really talking about my own personal experience. My whole life, I allowed toxicity into my life or with the people around me. I didn't have emotional boundaries. It didn't matter what was happening. There was no boundaries. And I feel like that really affected me emotionally and brought me to a level of, um, where, to a level where I was unhappy, to the, you know, the bottom frequencies where I was anxious or unhappy or depressed or sad. And really a lot of it was because I didn't know how to create those boundaries. And we talk about, and that could be from a number of things and factors and people, mainly people, right? And I know that in my entire life, and I think you can attest to this as well, that we didn't have those emotionally, emotional boundaries. How about the other one where, how often did you say no? Sure, I can do that. Sure, I can do that. I was always the pleaser, right? So I'm and never taking off every, like when we talk about emotional like self-care tips, when we're talking about no boundaries and taking on more, we took on, and I know a lot of people can identify with this emotional bound, uh, this emotional aspect of it. We take on everybody else and their problems. We want to be the good friend. We want to be the helper. Like we're taking on so much emotional baggage that just, it, it just doesn't belong to us. So you're correct. This is a very big one. And it's creating massive. the boundaries, was it, it's a combination of creating the boundaries and giving it back. And I thought that those were great. I know for myself and it's, it's when I mentally, metaphorically allowed myself to kind of, and I always give the analogy of the backpack where you're weighed down with everybody's emotions and everybody's problems and all the lineage stuff and this, that, and your own stuff and taking back the backpack and just kind of imagining you opening it up and realizing what belongs to everybody and kind of taking it out, not putting the backpack back on, but taking it all out and saying, Hey, here you go. This is yours. But gratefully saying, you know what, you know, I carried it honored to carry it, but here you go. <laughs> it's yours. Have it back. You don't have to take it back, but I'm keeping it. So wherever it right. ends up, I kind of can't help you. And I thought that that was, it just felt freeing. Something about it when you talk about breathing physical, you start to breathe again because you're no longer carrying all these emotions. And it now creates space for what you talk about. Now creating space to go to a place of what does make me happy? Where are my joy? Where is my joy coming from? Where is my happy? Like you're creating space now. Yeah. I think for me as well, when I think about this type of emotional well-being, I think about giving. For mm -hmm. me, it's one of the greatest things that you can do because in that moment of giving, it also makes someone feel good about what they're doing. And I'm not talking giving money. You can. I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. Giving time, giving your ear, even though we're talking about emotional boundaries, I'm not talking about you know, allowing someone to have that toxicity towards you. What I'm talking about is being there for your friends, your family, those that need you. So I feel like for me, emotional uh, self-care, there's a big part of that where, and I, it's really hard during COVID and, but there's still ways that you can find to be a giving person, uh, to finding compassion and empathy. And I find that that's really helpful with my emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. Especially during these times, let's bring COVID into it, the pandemic, the lockdowns, especially us being in Ontario and Canada, we've had more lockdowns than I think anybody in the world. Like, it's been really crazy. Absolutely. It, it has been. And it's really challenging for anybody to, and I know because I've spoken to a lot of people in Ontario who are emotionally tapped and they self-care having a like you know when we talk about the compassion the worry like all those the stresses that they're taking on the worry the everything uh job security how do you take care of yourself emotionally during these times and i like the way that you're talking about the giving aspect of it 
And it could be just to lend an ear, just to listen to somebody and be there for somebody um, and allow somebody to be there for you as well. Because a lot of times we take it on and a good self-care, uh, emotional tip, self-care tip is allowing somebody to hold space for you as well. So that's, that's really, that, that takes us to the next one, which is social self-care, right? Mm -hmm. And what you just said is asking for help. Mm -hmm. That's really critical. We are so, a lot of the times, especially um, with me having so much trauma in my life, I never asked for help because I was the helper, the martyr, the person that did everything. And there was nobody that could help me mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons, right? So I feel like what you just said is really, really critical in social self-care is asking for the help, mm -hmm. is saying to someone, I need help. I need you. I think that's really important. So social, that's a really good segue to social self-care because well, we're connected something. beings. And I think that especially what this pandemic has done, it's, it's, it's isolated us. So Absolutely. from a social self-care tip, it's really about, re it's, it's, it's allowing that connection to take shape and form in your life again. It's important. It's essential. I say when, you know, a baby requires touch and, you know, I, I was in the grocery store the other day and we're all masked up. I was in the grocery store and I ran into an old friend of mine and her automatic response was to go give me a hug. And then she, it was like a big theatrical drama in the grocery store because her automatic response was to give me a hug. And as she leaned in and I went to extend my arms to hug her back, she jumped back and said, oh my gosh, I'm not supposed to be hugging you. Are we going to get that in during trouble? COVID. I did the same thing. I saw someone I hadn't seen in a long time and I got, I was just getting in the car, got out of the car and I jumped and I, and I jumped, I was hugged her and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Right. Because you don't know, right? Because you're automatic and we've lost. So I think one of those, like that was just that, you know, that social piece of it, the interaction, the connection, the touch, all of that, we have we've lost it and it and it is sad it affects our emotional well-being it affects our physical well-being it affects us psychologically and one of the best ways that i feel that we can you know one of the self-care self-care tips socially for me is to make sure you have your bubble if you call it uh that we've called it over here in canada you know your bubble make sure that you're nurturing that bubble yeah absolutely this is a really tough one during COVID. Mm -hmm. I am a hugger. I am all about connection. It is a necessity for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about people that I know. I'm not talking about family, which I miss and love. Like I'm talking, but friends and family is the given. I enjoy talking to strangers. Um, I enjoy, you know, smiling at people. It's really right. We're losing all of us. <laughs> I am all about personal connection. That is something that fuels my heart and my soul. It's, it's really something that I'm missing in self care because there's not much that can be done. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day where I can go back to my hugging and I know it will come because I can't live without it. <laughs> and I know most, a lot of people not most, but a lot of people can't. So that's really important. So social self-care is really hard during these times, but there are things you can do. And I feel like, because we feel like we're isolated, we don't do it. So for example, have a FaceTime call with a friend or family, meet with someone, stay your six feet distance. Okay. Like people can't criticize you. I, my dad was over uh, this past weekend because we have a, like a little area that I do a little bit of growing plants, um, vegetable plants, and he grows his own plants. So he brought me a whole bunch and it was like really hard, but we were outside and we stayed the distance and it was really nice to be in his company. I, I miss him. I miss being around him and I miss being around people in general. So I think it's really important during these times that we still try to stay as connected as possible, whether it is just picking up the phone, whether it is a FaceTime or a Zoom call or anything you can do. And those that you can hug, go for it. Hug Absolutely. them more. Absolutely. Hug them more. I mean, we have, Lolo, kids... we have Lolo writing in, send personal, uh, send personal connection is huge and so vital to our well-being. And you said the same, Lolo. I'm not sure what was the same for was our comment. 
but yes, it was all on this connection piece there. So it is huge. It is it's massive. Important. I, I really, this is, like I said, this is a struggle for me. COVID, uh, I, like I feel very blessed and fortunate in my circumstances during COVID and, but mentally and emotionally, like those parts have been affected because of the social aspect of my life. Right. And, and, I, and I just have to say that when we're talking about this for anybody listening in worldwide, um, cause I know, you know, it's not all, it's not all a Canadian audience. Like we've got people from Europe and, and, and the United States and uh, Central America listening in. And I want you guys to know that um, because of this entire lockdown for Canada, we have now been, I think before, we, prior to COVID, we were um, rated the fourth most depressed country in the world. So now add that we are the country that has the most ridiculous, and I can't believe I'm saying this on TV, but we have the most ridiculous lockdowns in all of the world. Um, you yeah. know, is it's just no wonder we're, we we've teetered over the threshold. Like we're on a we're on an alarming rate of depression and suicide and all the rest of that because of this whole social aspect that has completely been stripped from us. Yeah, it, it's been tough. It has I'm not been. Gonna lie. It has been really tough. And, okay. you know, there's a lot, there's other things with social self-care, like when you make a commitment to someone, honoring commitments is really important in social self-care. You can't even, it's really hard to honor anything in, in social self-care these days, but we can still, I'm still reaching out to people and texting them and trying to be supportive in certain aspects of my life with other people. And I'm, you know, I've, I've certainly talked to Tanya a lot, um, not as often now, but like, you know, we do, we talk enough and I really try to remain social so that I'm getting that. And if I could have the opportunity to talk to a stranger, I do. I'm distanced. I'm still going to talk. I have my mouth on, but I'm, I'm still going to, you know, go out of my way. At first, I wasn't saying anything because everyone was so terrified. But now I'll go out. I talk to people and it's getting better. And I feel like we're going to be free from this eventually. And we'll be able to get back to that. Um, and so one of the aspects of social self-care, too, let's go on to the next one. Unless you have something else to say about it. I know it's a big one, right? Okay. So I just know I'm going to tell everybody out there that I've had people come up to me and give me a hug and say, oh, I don't care anymore. I'm done with it. <laughs> I know it's so hard because you don't know who's accepting, who's not, but I just want to just hug everybody. Like, I yeah, like they're just like, I don't think, care. Who's this crazy lady after COVID? She's hugging everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so and I'm okay with that. I'm okay yeah. for people to judge me as crazy. I'm fine with that. Um, but so part yeah. of the social aspect for many people is professional self-care, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of aspects to that one. But when we talk about professional self-care, a lot of people were going to offices. So they were also getting the social aspect, but we're not doing that now. So, so everybody's working from that, home, right? Exactly. So we're not interacting with people as often, whereas we were before. So that was really helping. And people could see if something was going on with people. Now nobody knows because everybody's like, most people, I shouldn't say that. For me, uh, I worked from home for the last few years, but I still went to the office and I would pick up things. And so I was still interacting and meeting with people. So, but many people have gone from a total office environment to home, right? And so they're working longer hours at home because there's the, they're replacing their commute time with working time. They're more logged on to the computers. Like I didn't realize there was a whole other pandemic going on with people working from home and move and transitioning where they're not no longer taking care of themselves. They were actually taking better care of themselves being out in the office, thinking that they weren't versus being at home because even they're in their pajamas, they're not having a reason to get up and to get dressed. They're, you know, yeah. logging on on their computers and they're not having a reason to, there's no downtime, even on the commute, as much as everybody doesn't like traffic, it was their one time of, of decompressing between transitioning from the office over to home. So all yeah. of a sudden that gets removed and you're just, so in the very beginning of the pandemic, everybody loved it, but people were saying they were actually spending 12 to 13 hours of actual work time in front of the computer. I thought that was profound. I do work quite a bit, um, considering that I work from home, but I mean, that's, that's, 
very good point. And we have to know when to separate boundaries. So we talk about emotional boundaries. What about professional boundaries? And I can tell you just from past, I mean, this is recent that I've worked from home, but what about my past? I was always there. There was one job that I worked in for many years for about five or six years, many, you know, and I was there weekends and all hours. And I, you know, was told that I needed to go somewhere and to do it now. And there was no, it didn't matter if it was my anniversary or my birthday, nothing mattered. It didn't matter what I had to celebrate or things I had to do in my my life. There was no boundaries. It Mm -hmm. was like, you're doing this. And I'd be like, okay, I can do that. And I just let it go to the point where it was just, it was overwhelming. And I think a lot of us do this. A lot of us feel that that we have this necessity or this need to, you know, show them that we can do this and we're going to do it and we're go-getters. And Really, I think that when once people recognize how important you are as an individual in their organization, they won't allow you to do that. And I felt like in most of my previous jobs that I was that person. I know there's many people out there that do this, that have no boundaries, that never say no at work. So that's really important is that you create those boundaries. That you say, no, these are my hours. I'm working. I'm going home. And even if you don't have, or even with the pandemic, like setting those stops where guys, this is my break time. This is the, like setting, like you're not working those, you know, 12 to 13 hours a day, but yeah. you're still giving yourself an opportunity to work your eight hour day and still take your two breaks. Like it, it has to translate. You have to feel good about you know, still knowing that you get, you're actually more productive in those eight hours, in my opinion, because you don't have the office interruption where somebody comes to your desk, somebody needs you to do this. Like, it's just, you're actually working more at home in those eight hours and now giving your company extended time. Yeah. You don't even have, like, think about all those times you're sitting in your car driving and you're blaring the music and you're singing to the top of your lungs and just enjoying, you lose that. Yeah, absolutely you do you got it's sort of like 12 13 hours of your day Mm -hmm. with with not you know it just burnt out absolutely um and just a couple of other things that i want to talk about when it comes to professional self-care what about what we're doing and you know progressing our skills a lot of us are redundant in jobs and just feel like that's all you can do But I feel like part of professional self-care is building your skills and becoming better at what you do. And Mm -hmm. maybe that means moving on to another job and Mm -hmm. knowing when it's time to move on from that job. I'm not saying to quit. I'm not telling anyone to quit their job. You know, for me, I was always that mind of have a job before you quit your job, right? So that you have some stability and it's easier. Some people can't do that though. They're in really terrible, toxic jobs, just like relationships. Mm -hmm. And you need a way out. I know lots of people have just picked up and left and said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. Right. And when that door closes, another one opens, Mm -hmm. right? I know it's so cliche, but it's true. Right. And I feel that that's really important. So knowing your boundaries, knowing when you've had enough, knowing what your needs are and relating those needs to your boss. This is what I need to do a good job. How many of us have ever said that to our boss? I was going to say, it's fine. It's not even finding your voice because like, we all have a voice. It's about using your voice, having the courage to use your voice and to, you know, the, the, the self-care tip is using that voice to teach people how to treat you, including your boss. Absolutely. It's so important because I feel like if you don't and you don't set clear boundaries or tell them what you need. Like, I know that when I was at my previous job, I have my daughter, who's a competitive gymnast, and I would have to go, she was doing, she was at uh, another gym where she was doing an afternoon uh, from like, she was there from one to seven or one to six, whatever it was at the time. And she was only in grade, oh my goodness, four or yeah, four or five. Anyways, regardless, I had to leave to go get her on my lunch. I had to drive like a maniac. I felt so pressured and stressed and I, you know, it was like, I didn't have a chance. So I would eat at my desk, even though it was frowned upon. You could see that people were looking at me funny, like I'd already left and now I'm eating. But then the reality was that I used to stay after work and work till I picked her up at seven o'clock or whatever the time was. So I was still at the office working when everybody long had gone home, but nobody saw that. 
And it was always frowned upon. So if I were to walk in five minutes late or took an extra 10 minutes at lunch, it was always like, but I, I just put in three extra hours last night or two extra hours. And don't you see that? So I really feel like being in a job like that, and hopefully people will move more towards that and recognizing what your employees' needs are. It's really important. What you get out of employees that are happy is beyond what you can imagine. Right. So that for me is really important. Right. We have Alicia writing in saying, teaching people how to treat you. It's so good. And when I hear you talking about your situation right there, you know, it's, I, I'm, I, you know, I was not always in my life, but there were those nugget moments in my life where I was like, okay, look, that's fine. If you're going to nitpick on the, you know, the 80, 20 rule, we're focused on 20% that we don't have when 80% of it's really great. You want to nitpick on that. Guess what? I'm going to clock out at five o'clock and those two extra hours that I would normally stay giving to the company unpaid. I'm out. <laughs> right? Yeah. I just felt like I wanted to give back. I felt like, right. Oh, I'm taking, it's taking me an hour and 15 or 20 minutes to do the drive there and back. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should, and so I just wanted to give more because I felt like, but I, it was still, I could see that, that crooked eye or whatever you want to call it, looking at me all the time. And I was like, okay, so it just, you have to know when to ask for things. You have to know and be confident because you'd be surprised. You know, it's hard to train and retrain employees. Very difficult, right? You are an asset. Remember that in your mind. Tell yourself you're an asset. That's a big you're one. there. You're there for a reason. We are fear. We fear, and we are fear. We fear losing our jobs, being judged, you know, and the stability. But the reality is that if they, if you feel good about yourself and confident, and you know you're an asset, you will be an asset. Mm -hmm. Right. It's also what we tell ourselves. That's another another topic, of course, because we always talk about the stories we tell ourselves, and that's really important. Right. Well, we had a guest on uh, Myron Parks uh, a few weeks ago from Chicago. Yeah. And what he does professionally, he said something as a servant leader that was profound to me. He said, companies need to transition from coming in and interviewing the employee versus having the employee interview the interviewee. And I thought, yeah. how does one do that? And you learn a lot more about the individual when you flip the script. Yeah. What a creative way to learn about your candidate coming in and understanding. And it was about understanding what their needs were and being fair to the organization, knowing whether or not they could fulfill the commitment to the needs of the potential candidate. That's awesome. And I was like, wow, like how amazing is that if companies could understand whether they could fulfill the need not yeah. the other way around how much more productivity they would get out of individuals and that's a self-care tip for organizations <laughs> absolutely I, honestly who does not like if you run an organization or you're a manager you want happy employees you right. will get the most out of your employees if they are happy right it's very simple it's proven right? It's proven. And I feel like employees have this old mentality. It's time to lift that up and like come to a new level right. and really understand who works for you and appreciate them. That's what people want. Absolutely. They want to be loved. They want to be appreciated. So let's, let's move on to like environmental, environmental self-care, because I think that's really important. It really ties in, it ties into a place of work, like keeping like an organized workspace, at home, though, it, it's the same thing. I feel if I'm disorganized, it drives me crazy. I go through things and drawers and I have to organize. It's not that I'm OCD about it, and that's okay if you are, but it's not to that point. But I find if I'm going through a drawer, I just cleaned out all my bathroom drawers. Garbage, garbage. Like, the stuff in there I don't even need. I'm like, organize, organize. Like, I just want to be organized. So that's really good for your spirit because you feel like you can find things. You feel like you're organized. You feel like you know where things are. And it feels good to do it. Decluttering, um, minimalizing. And I went through this and I started going through and just getting rid of stuff because I had so much stuff. I still have so much stuff. And I really look forward to actually letting it go. It, if it's not serving a purpose for me, 
And I suggest that it, it really does feel good. I'm talking about, let's talk about clothes. I, I just, I can't even get through my wardrobe anymore. I have so much and I threw out bags and bags of stuff. Number one, because we have smaller closets, we moved and we had smaller closets. And I thought, oh, I can't get rid of my stuff. And then I started going through my clothing and I was like, I've never worn that. Well, where'd that come from? I haven't worn that in five years. I haven't, what? Oh no. And so I just got rid of everything and I still have plenty and I have regular go-tos and not a lot of transitional, like, like not that they're not transitional pieces. It's just, there's things that I, I don't know. I just have so many, so much of everything. Right. So I found that when I started doing that, I felt better. I could find things easier and it's a plan of mine to do again, because I'm noticing even with the smaller wardrobe that I have, I don't wear half of it. And I'm, what am I saving it for? A rainy day? Especially even if it was that. a rainy day, I wouldn't wear it. So it's really like, I have a lot of, like when I was younger, we didn't have a lot. So I have this connection to, you know, it's not hoarding. Like I don't hoard, but I do have a connection to keeping things. And now I'm starting to release. I've been doing that for a while, but I'm getting better and better at it. And I find the more that I release, the better I feel. Good. And we have uh, Alicia re, uh, writing in decluttering is cleaning. And, and yes, and everybody knows that feeling. Everybody out there that has done, even if you clean out a simple, let's do it. Let's take it down to something so simple as cleaning out one drawer. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, you don't have to go like crazy All and crazy. do everything at once because it's, it's really, it's, one. There's this emotional level that comes with decluttering, right? right. Because well, like energy, like when we take it to energy, it's like all of a sudden you feel lighter, your body energetically, you feel like you're, you've created, like it's that feeling of you can breathe. You feel like you're not hanging on to something. There's so many different pieces to it. And you actually feel like you look forward to something new coming into your life, something fresh because you've created space. Yeah. You don't have anything weighing you down. Those mental thoughts. Like it's just, it, it's all encompassing. I absolutely agree. So I think that's really, really important that we look at our environment and what we can do. And it could just be simple. Like I know that after we eat, sometimes dishes are left. Like if I don't have time or running around or decide to go for a walk instead, it bothers me. Like I want it cleaned up. Right. So it could just be something that simple um, is just cleaning up your, your kitchen just to tidy up. So it doesn't just have to be down the counters. Like yeah. <laughs> anybody feeling me up there? Like even just oh, yeah. physically wiping down the counters, moving that appliance, like a small little appliance in your countertop and wiping, wiping behind there. It's just so nice when you wake up in the morning and it's a fresh kitchen. It's like a new start, right? Yeah. It's like a fresh start. And you know, by the end of the day, it's going to be crazy, but yeah. that's okay. Um, well, you know what? I my it's funny enough, ironically, environment. My kids had this conversation with, you know, they sat at the dinner table the other day with us and uh, my other daughters returned and they said they were having a chitty chatter with a friend. And the friend was like, oh, my mom made my bed. And my kids were like, what do you mean your mom made your bed? <laughs> she's like, doesn't everybody's mom makes their bed? And they're like, my mother has never made my bed. <laughs> but my kids have always made their bed. Like they will never, the first thing they do when they wake up is make their beds. They said that coming into their room, they've just never been trained that way, I guess. And I didn't even realize it, I have to be honest. They just cannot get into their room with an unmade bed. Like it's just a foreign concept to them. So they feel successful Amazing. just making their bed. And that's, that could just be, it could be that small. Do you right. know what I mean? Like what in your environment can you change to make you feel a little bit better? Right. Because again, your environment, especially today, especially in your home, what can you do to make yourself feel a little bit better in your environment at home? Absolutely. Uh, let's move on. There's a couple more that I want to talk about, and we're almost towards the end. So I really think. Oh, are we there already? Oh my goodness! Thank you. Be Fifty here, <laughs> ten minutes. It's a massive topic, and I know we're going really fast. And you know, I really want to give some more tidbits. But the next one I want to talk about is spiritual self care, mm. because. I feel this is really, really important for me. It may not be important for everybody, but there's things in spiritual self-care like praying, if that's what you want to do, meditation, bringing yourself 
to a different level internally so that your external world looks different. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about this. We talk about meditation. We talk about doing this and being still with our time. We talk about walking in nature and how important that is for our spiritual well-being. Being in nature is meditative. So I want to talk about, we, I, I know we touch on God and the aspect of God, but I think it's really important for me. I was born and raised Catholic. I don't necessarily practice Catholicism, and, but I'm a very spiritual being. It's really important for me to pray mm -hmm. um, because I feel this connection and not just praying, but I also feel a connection to the universe. So when I'm in nature, I feel connected to nature. Mm -hmm. And when I'm meditating, I feel connected to myself and to a higher power. Because I, I don't know, for anyone who has a meditation practice, I know where it's brought me in my life. And we've talked about this through, you know, many of the shows and how important meditation has been in my life mm -hmm. and how that really helped me in a transitional period in my life where I didn't think I was going to survive because it got me to a different spiritual place mm -hmm. it's that whole like as you're saying it and to me when I relate it to self-care it's essential for me to feel that inner connection to something yeah. greater than myself and mm -hmm. it's making time to ensure that emotionally and mentally for me not necessarily physically I gotta be honest but at least emotionally and mentally for me it what it resonates with me on a self-care level is maintaining that inner connection to something greater than myself i'll be a god or you know what, what whatever you believe i mean we all there i mean there, right we there are atheists right and that's fine and that's everybody has a choice i you know i feel uh religion does separate people but it also brings us together i feel mm -hmm like religion should bring us together. And I wish it did more so than it does mm -hmm. because truly, what is it? Like we are praying, we are trying to be better people. We're praying for things and for people, for other people, for people that are sick. I, I, I do, I, I, I sit there and I pray for people that are sick or you'll read a post, please pray for this person. And I will sit and I'll say, it doesn't, it, I don't do an extended prayer. I simply say, I pray that everything will go well for your father's surgery or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, it's really important from a spiritual perspective to do what fuels your soul, you know, to be in a spiritual place, if that's what you choose. It's not for everybody. Meditating is not for everybody, but I wanna just reiterate one thing very quickly. When we talk about meditation, people always have this impression, not always, but many are oftentimes have this impression that meditation is really difficult. I can't meditate because all I do is have these thoughts that go through my head. But that's part of the point of meditation is to sit with those things because there is where you actually start listening to your true self as well, mm -hmm. in my experience. So, Absolutely. So it's okay. And remember, the human has 40 to 60,000 thoughts a day. 40, like, listen to that number. We're mm -hmm. actually thinking right now, like everything that we do, we're constantly thinking. And so obviously when you're quiet, you're going to hear those thoughts more, but there's so many different types of meditation that you can do, you know, that allows you to come back to your breath, for example, or using a mantra um, or visualizing, painting. But I like the way that, like, I'm gonna take it a few sentences back because, what I hear when I heard you talk about that spiritual connection that you just said, you said it's a moment to hear yourself. Mm -hmm. It is a moment to get that connection where, you know, where that mindfulness, all that stuff is understanding the divine within. Yeah. It so is important. the intuition. It's the guidance. It's the what's next. It's like, you know, I, I'm sorry that we have five minutes left because it's a <laughs> big component. I know. That intuition and listening to yourself, that mm -hmm. spiritual component is the core essence of Teresa, the core Absolutely. essence of Tanya. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge self-care 
tip that we must give For me, it is huge. And I can tell you that it was instrumental in me healing my traumas, learning more about myself and getting to a better place in my life and starting to live the better version of myself, which I think evolves and gets better every day. But I, that's really important. I just want to touch on one last one. Mm-hmm. It's also yes, for a minute. <laughs> that's it. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk really fast. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> financial self-care. So just a couple of tidbits, like what can we do? What are we talking about? Budgets. You know, how much money can I afford to spend? Taking the time to look at your finances, understanding them. What money can I save? Because we should be saving money. And mm-hmm. even if it's only, you know, whatever you can, it doesn't have to be enormous amounts of money. But if you can, that's really important. So I think our financial self-care is critical because it's what we use to survive. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand it and we never look at it or we just spend frivolously and then our credit cards are maxed out, you know, how do we ever get to a better place financially? Mm -hmm. So it's that balance because I remember saying to my kids now that they're getting older, I said, one of the easiest muscles that you will develop in this world in this lifetime is spending. One of the hardest muscles to develop is saving. So yes. learn how to develop the muscle now when you're living at home under your parents' roof, <laughs> like exercise that muscle and let it carry you through your whole life. And I said, live on a 50-50 rule. And that 50-50 rule of the balance is 50% of your income belongs to savings and the other 50% belongs to whatever your cost of living is. We'll see when they're 30, how that translates. We'll do another. Yeah, because that can be hard, right? Especially right, when of you're losing your jobs and stuff. <laughs> I know. But it's it really hard to talk about that. But it's a good, if you can get that team. mindset. Yeah. It's like, okay, look, right now you guys are in your saving years. There's nothing for you to be spending on at all. So you- yeah, I think, I think the really important part in all of that is what is a need and what is a want, right? right. The wants are okay as long as the needs are met. So mm-hmm. often we spend money on our wants and forget about the, the needs are more important, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's important. huge. And yeah. like I was talking about minimalizing and getting rid of stuff. I have so much stuff that I've spent money on that I'm like, wait a minute, why did I spend all this money? Mm-hmm. And it's, so it's a really important for me. It's a really important aspect of my life that I understand what I have, what's available to me, my incoming, my, my money coming in, my money going out. So budgeting is a really good one. Um, but that's, you know, that's one of the final things that I can say in self-care. I think that that's the, the eight that, you know, we can talk about and hopefully that we, you know, impacted someone and they've learned a little bit of how we do our self-care or some ideas, some new ideas. And, I and think self-care, that- you know, I think it's important to let everybody know, cause we're talking about the way we do it. We're not, you know, as much as we'd like to be consistent with it, there are moments in life where things happen that you have to adjust. And you fall off track and then you, and I think the idea is be, being mindful and aware of it to know that it's time to get back on track. Uh, you know, even me starting this talk show, there's been moments where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, and I've said to you, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm losing time in a day. I've had to cancel a few meetings, reschedule this, move things around, come off social media a little bit. So you get into the moment where you, you know, I'm an overachiever. So all of a sudden I'm taking more on my plate, taking more on my plate, taking, and then, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> You're like, wait a second, yeah. Let's go, right? So it's constantly being aware of what your limits are and understanding what, what needs nourishing in that moment, whether it's the physical, the psychological, or all of it. It's understanding what requires attention in that moment. So um, I think that that's a, a big part of self-care is just the awareness and knowing how to how to, to get it back in check. You, you have to realize that all these par- different aspects really are inter- intertwined. Of course so they if you're doing yeah. something physically, you're going to feel better emotionally. Right. Um, right. And if you do, you know, if you're doing some of the other things, you're going to feel better mentally. And you're going to feel like if you're doing the financial part of it or the spiritual part, you're going to feel better. You're going to be happier. You're going to be, you know, less stressed or less anxious. So they all really, you know, work together, but you're mm-hmm. right. My last thing that, you know, this is the end of the show, unfortunately, because we could probably just talk for, I know we're talking really (laughs) fast on this. I didn't realize it would go so fast. It always does. But I just want to say like, do one little thing every day, one little thing, clean out one small drawer or go for that one minute walk, 
feel what you need in that moment and do it and recognize that something can wait that extra few minutes. You know, take care of yourself because if we can't take care of ourselves, just like if we can't love ourselves, we can't take care of others. We Absolutely. have to come first in our lives. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to leave you with. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you everybody for tuning in, Teresa. Thank you for giving us the eight tips, physical, psychological, emotional, social, professional, environmental, spiritual, and financial tips to self-care. I really appreciated it this evening. And, um, you know, the little technical glitch was my way of, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Was that me? <laughs> Tune in tomorrow. We will be back to the basics with Tara Donald. Uh, no, sorry, Tara Rhodes and Miranda uh, Donald uh, will be tomorrow evening. Uh, remember to like and subscribe Tanya Talks 4. I think I've lost my grammar already. <laughs> <in this. laughs> um, <laughs> real talk, real issues, real people, real events. That's Tanya Talks. Uh, if you're looking to take your life to the next level, please visit TanyaExperience.com. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Teresa, my co-host, thank you for chiming in tonight. We will see you all again tomorrow. Good night. Thanks, Tanya. Good night.